right, so I was planning out this whole discussion on the history of music, tuning styles, chord frequencies and overtones, along with what makes certain notes sound harmonious or disharmonious together. But then I realized it's not really important for the discussion of the DIY piano and would have taken over an hour, so I decided to scrap it. Maybe at some point I'll dive into the mathematics of music theory because it's frankly a fascinating topic, but the time for that isn't now. Instead, let's focus on the isomorphic keyboard layout as compared to a regular piano layout before finishing on the Yonko piano layout. So, what makes a layout isomorphic or not? Well, isomorphic is derived from the Greek words iso, meaning equal, and morphosis, meaning to form or to shape. In the case of uh, musical keyboard layouts, this means that a given shape or spacing between two keys on the keyboard will always correspond to the same interval or musical spacing between the two notes. Let's take a look at a regular piano layout first and show why it isn't isomorphic and why I consider it enough of an issue to warrant building a DIY piano in order to fix it. Now, first things first, a bit of music theory. Uh, the vast majority of modern pianos are tuned to what's known as 12-tet tuning or 12-tone equal temperament. This means there are 12 notes in a single octave, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, with the following being one in the next octave. Or if we use musical naming conventions, uh, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, and B, with the next note being C in the next octave. Uh, ignore me starting from C instead of A, it's not important. What is, however, is the equal temperament part, which essentially says that the spacing between each consecutive note is the same, or that the ratio of the frequencies between two adjacent notes is exactly a 12th root of two, no matter if the note is natural, aka white on the keyboard, or sharps, aka black. And that's about as far as I'm willing to go down this rabbit hole on camera. If you're interested, I will link a couple of videos in the description, but we'll just have to end it there. And suffice it to say that the interval between each successive note or key is called one semitone with two semitone intervals adding up to one whole tone interval. So C to C sharp here is one semitone and C to D is one whole tone. Uh, D to E is also one whole tone and E to F is one semitone. See the issue here? Because there isn't a black key in between E and F, the interval between them is a single semitone, much like between C and C sharp, but unlike the interval between C and D or D and E. And this means that a whole tone interval can have different shapes based on which key we start from. So all of the following are single whole tone intervals. C, D, C sharp, D sharp, D, E, D sharp, F, E F sharp and F G. They all represent the same interval and yet there are four shapes on the keyboard that you would need to memorize. Uh, the same is true for every other interval barring an octave and it is this exact issue that makes the piano keyboard non-isomorphic and makes memorizing chords and progressions anywhere from 6 to 12 times harder. Now let's do a more complicated example. Uh, this right here is the C major chord. It can be easily remembered as 158 starting at C as follows. So starting at C as the first or root note, we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which is the E, our second note, and finish with 6, 7, 8, or G, our third note. If we were to put some music jargon on top of what we've just done, we have C as our root note, two whole tones or a major third interval up from the root note to E, our second note, and uh, three whole tones and a semitone or a perfect fifth interval up from the root note, we have G, our third note of the chord. With this being the C major, then this would then be the D major. Oh, sorry, that's the D minor. This is the D major. It's constructed the same way as before, 158 pattern, starting on D instead of C. So we have 1 D, 2, 3, 4, 5, F sharp, 6, 7, 8, A, making the D major the D, F sharp, A chord. 
Although its pattern is exactly the same as that of C major, you can clearly see that the shape of the keys is no longer lower, 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 but is now lower, upper, lower. Here, in fact, is a set of every major chord shape on the piano. Well, technically there are three times as many due to each chord having two inversions, but that's not important right now. Essentially, there are six different shapes that a ma major chord can take on the piano based on which root note the chord starts from, with the player having to memorize each of them along with which shape to use based on the given root note. And this is just for the major chord. There are also six more different shapes for a minor chord and six more for each of the other chords, of which there are quite a lot. And so we circle back to the idea of isomorphism. As I've just shown, the classical piano layout isn't isomorphic, so let's take some steps to fix that, starting with the simplest solution, a single row of 12 keys. In this layout, the keys follow the progression of one semitone difference between each adjacent key. There isn't multiple rows to kind of get muddied up. So your major chord will just be, as we said before, you have your root note, skip three, second note, skip two, third note. Same shape for all major chords. And it's not like this is a revolutionary idea. Here's an example of a piano keyboard that does just that. Of course, there are issues. With all the keys in a single row like this, you end up having to pick between either a very wide octave or keys so narrow you're likely to press two or three at the same time. And the solution? You use multiple rows. You can then have a specific interval for traveling along a row and a different interval for traveling up or down rows. As long as you stick to the same intervals, you'll still have an isomorphic keyboard. Let's take a look at a basic example. Two rows of six keys each, going along a row is always a full tone, while going up or down a row is a semitone. Note that this is very similar to a regular piano, just with five of the keys flipped. In fact, here's a picture of a piano that does just that. Now, in this configuration, your C major shape is like this, and a D major is exactly the same, just one note to the right. The issue, of course, with this two row setup is you still have two different shapes depending on which row you start with. Much better than the six that we have on the regular piano, but still. A C sharp major chord, for example, necessitates you to start from the lower row, essentially giving us a mirrored position with lower, lower, upper shape instead of upper, upper, lower. Now, of course, we can do better. Let's just add an extra row or two of identical keys and this is how we end up with the Yanko layout. And the C major shape is now formed like so, as are all the other major shapes. You have D major, E major, F major, F sharp major, and so on. Now, in terms of why we have six rows when three would have been enough, and well, it just makes finger placement less awkward. The general idea is that the first row is there for your thumb, with the next three rows for your other fingers, however, is more natural. Uh, if you need to play a note with your thumb that isn't on the first row, you use the second row for your thumb and the next three rows above for the rest of your fingers. The last uh, sixth row is then only used if you want to transpose the entire piece. So if you memorize the piece that makes use of the first five rows and you want to play it in a different key, you can just move sideways however many whole tones and shift one row up if necessary for a single semitone and then play the piece with exactly the same fingering as before. The very top section of narrow keys then gives the player the ability to play a chromatic glissando, or if they want a whole tone glissando, they can use any of the other six rows. You also have interesting note patterns, such as a trill using the four fingers like so, uh, playing both hands over one another with the same notes more easily, or the semitone grace slide notes like so. So, uh, let's cover some downsides. Uh, first of all, without the spacing between black notes, it's difficult to feel where your hands are on the piano. So, sight reading without glancing at the keyboard is harder, as you have to essentially memorize the intervals through sheer practice. Though, let's be honest, it's not like you don't have to do that on a regular piano anyway. 
And the second issue lies in the lack of instruction books, teachers, or virtually any guides whatsoever, be they online or paperback for learning to play this style of piano. And thus far, I found four instruction books translated from German with exercises and uh, guides, but that's a drop in the bucket when compared to the amount available for a classical piano. Personally, I feel this isn't going to be too much of an issue, seeing as how most piano techniques should translate well to a Yanko piano, but something to keep in mind. And lastly, the fact that once I move to the Yanko keyboard layout, I won't be able to sit down at a normal piano, be it at a friend's house or at public ventures and play. I'd instead need to bring my own Yanko keyboard with me and uh, play on that. Uh, kind of a non-issue, at least for me, seeing as thus far in my piano playing journey, the number of times I played on anything but my uh, Korg SP250 digital piano stands at a grand total of zero, but once again, something to keep in mind. So yeah, uh, that concludes my talk about the Yanko layout that I decided to base my DIY digital piano on. Next up, I will talk about the various piano actions in both acoustic and digital pianos, along with a Hickman action design that I ended up adopting. Thank you for your time, and see you guys later.